fix this. Hi, I'm Greg. I maintain the TTY layer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's bad, Thomas. It's bad. Um, I only maintain it because nobody else will. Um, it's just maintenance. I review patches, I don't do new development. We have known bugs in there with crashers that we cannot fix. Um, <laughs> there was one person who did a lot of work on it about a year ago, and then he disappeared. Um, anybody want to maintain it or do work? I got a lot of stuff. Um, it's scary. But we're not going to talk about that. Um, so this is a talk, in a way I've been giving, I gave this at, was it Lightning Talk, was it last year or two years ago here? about how the kernel security model is a little different, how we release patches. And since then, I've been giving this talk to companies um, in a longer format for the past year and a half. And I've been working a lot with Google to influence the companies to try and do better. And um, it's changing. It's getting better. I'll show you a demo at the end. We're not quite there yet, um, but it's getting better. Uh, so it's not technical. Um, somebody noted today that we have all of the active, stable kernel maintainers in the room, which is the first time ever. Um, we have over half the kernel security team here, um, and a lot of other maintainers. This is not a technical talk. Um, it turns out it's just to talk about our process. We've been doing this for so long, a lot of people forget what we do. So if nothing else, I'm giving this to the video so I can point people at this so I don't have to do this again. But please, heckle, ask questions as I go along. So I always start out, um, latest kernel, 413, we've cracked 60,000 files finally. Almost tw 24 million, 25 million lines of code. Um, you only run less than that. My laptop only runs 2.1 million. Your phone runs about 3.4, 3.5 million, because phones and SOCs are horrible. I'll talk more about that later. Um, so you're not running the whole kernel, of course. You just care about the core and the rest of the, your few drivers. Um, John Corbett and I do a lot of work on tracking this, and we write a paper. Every year, and we're going to do it. We'll release it at Prague for the OSS conference there and the Kernel Summit in a few weeks. So, I did all the numbers. So, the past year, we had over 4,000 developers for the first time and over 500 companies. Um, I think I got all the companies. There's a few we don't know about, um, but over 500 companies. So, our, our community keeps growing, gets better, uh, bigger, more new developers, actually, a constant number of new developers, at least 200 new developers every kernel release. Um, more people contributing overall, we're doing good stuff. Um, I've given this talk. I can't say scary, but it's scary. Um, that's our rate of change last year. A lot of the lines added were influenced by the DRM, AMD DRM driver, which added a ton of tables, which don't matter unless you have an AMD device. And then it does matter, so it does count. So we do show that. Um, that's the lines added every day. Our rate of change, again, keeps going up. And this is where companies start freaking out. Um, eight and a half changes an hour. A year ago, we were eight changes an hour. Um, but realistically, we're really going faster now. And this is where companies and people get in trouble. Um, they look at our numbers two years ago, three years ago, where we were going five or six changes an hour. And they realize that if I release an SOC today, I support it for two years or three years, and I do another release, another one. They don't realize that we're going faster and doing more work in that same time span than we were previously. So as they're fixed clock cycles of when they release chips, when they release devices, they're getting further and further behind upstream. And they don't realize it. It's happened all the time that it's really exponentially catching up with them, and they're in real trouble. They have to catch up, <laughs> and they have to work upstream. Um, this is our changes per hour, our last release. 4.9, 4.12 were really, really big. 4.9, I can blame some of the people in this room for being really doing a lot of work. 4.12, I don't know why. 4.12 is just a lot of work. Um, 4.13, we're back down to eight and a half, almost nine changes an hour, back down. Um, it's going fast. So, John Corbett gave a talk at the Plumbers and OSS conference last week or two weeks ago and talked about a release model. Um, it turns out a lot of people and a lot of companies still think of this old release model of you do a lot of work and then you release a new kernel. You do a lot of work and release another kernel a couple years later. They saw that with our change from 2.6 to 3.0, then 4.0. They thought, oh, you're doing new features to release it. But no. In the old model, we did this. 2.2 was in January of that year. Two years later, we did another one. 
Three years later, really much, we did 2.6. Now in between these times when we were doing a lot of development, um, if you were using Linux and you were a developer then, you never want to do that again because people were backporting things because they had to ship devices. They had to ship big systems. And they had to ship lots of new features. They wanted those new features. We're working on our development model, our development branch to go into our stable branch. So anybody who was on that, that years, we don't want to ever do that again. It was hell. It was really, really hard. So after, in January of 2004, Linus made the rule, everything's going to be stable. Let's try this. <laughs> Everybody laughed at us. Um, but we did it. So the new release model is, we do a new release. I say new because we've been doing this since 2004. What? 15 years? <laughs> um, it's crazy. So this is our release model. We do every two to three months, we do a release, and the whole thing is stable. That's how it works. We have stable kernels, and I'll talk about that in a little minute, but we don't have long development cycles. We have short, we take patches of what they come, we don't work on features, we don't stall things. We take what th comes in and do a release. Take it, we do a release. Time-based releases. It works really well. So much so that other projects have adopted this. Companies can now plan if they know, oh, this release, I'm going to release this device on that date. What kernel version do I need to aim for? It becomes very, very predictable. And then in 2007, um, I didn't come up with a name for this. Somebody last two weeks ago named it. Um, we came up with it, and the kernel developers made to the public a promise that we will not break user space. Because we want you to update your kernels. We want you to be able to trust that our, these releases are stable. So our commitment to everybody is we will not break you. <laughs> on purpose. And that's it. We won't break you on purpose. If we see that we did break you, we will revert it. Um, a little known fact, if nobody notices it, it wasn't broken. <laughs> um, so we do change things. We do change the user space API at times, but if nobody noticed that we changed it, then that was fine. Um, we do kind of work where there's a little gray middle layer sometimes in the kernel and user space, like lib U, or U events and things like that. We work together with people. The DRM layer is crazy. There is always exceptions, but we do try and work really, really hard. This rule is the only rule that Linus will yell at you for if you break it on purpose. Break it accidentally, no problem, fix it and move on. If you break it on purpose and double down on why you want to break it on purpose, he will curse at you. Um, that's it. That's the only thing Linus complains about, really. Well, don't break his tree. <laughs> okay, don't break his tree. <laughs> um, don't break his laptop, yeah, but on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then no, he does still curse at other people at times. Right, well, that's another story. But do this, and he will yell at you. I mean, the infamous Morrow rant was because of this. Morrow was breaking user space on purpose, and Linus said no. So that's our promise. We made it at the Kernel Summit 2007, and we have kept it since then. So companies need to realize it's been a decade that we've prom made this promise. You can look back and see our track record. We do mean this. So always update your kernels. Always feel comfortable moving to the next one and updating and moving on. And another important thing about this, um, version numbers don't mean anything at all. <laughs> and a lot of people don't understand this. It just means that one is newer than the other. That's it. That's the only reason. So everybody's like, wait, 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 why'd you move from 3.0 or to 3.0? And literally, it's because I bribed Linus with whiskey. In 2011, we were at 2.6.38 or something crazy. And it, or 20, yeah, 38. Um, it turns out your brain, when you see numbers like 27 to 29 or 27 to 30, it doesn't think it's a big change as like 3 to 5 or 3 to 7. It's just the brain doesn't work that way. So bigger numbers seem smaller incrementally. So by bumping to a higher number, incrementing the first version, it makes things easier. We start over and go again. So at LinuxCon Japan, we bought the best bottle of whiskey that I could find. Linux Foundation paid for it. Um, and we drank it in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Not me and Linus only, all the kernel developers there. Um, that went fast. I don't know. Were you there? I don't know. Some people were there. It was good. For me? 2011. <laughs> no, it wasn't the horse. It might have been the horse meat night. Yes. That's another story. <laughs> that was 2009. Okay, we've had a lot of Japanese stories. Um, and subsequently, from 3.0 to 4, or 3.x to 4.x, 
2015. I didn't bribe Linus this time, um, but he did it anyway, and we increment the number, so it's about, what, 14, 11? Every four years, we'll increment the number based on how long things go. So again, we'll go from 4.x to 5.x just to keep things easy for us to understand. Version numbers mean nothing. Please remember that. What happens when the major number is too big? What is, define too big? I, I don't know. Justify, yeah, we'll go backwards, yeah. We'll start going backwards. Well, I mean, at four years per this, maybe we all get to retire? I don't know. My son will take over. We start again at one, but NG. NG at the end of it, no. <laughs> then NG, NG, no. Um, I, have invent, I have created a project called dash NG, and I was yelled at so hard. Um, okay, what's next? So this is how we do kernels. Again, all of you guys have seen this talk before, um, but for those who haven't, Linus does a release in green, and then he, uh, two weeks later, for two weeks, all the kernel maintainers throw all their stuff at him that have been in the tree, their public trees, and then he does release candidate one, and then one week later, release candidate two, three, four, five, six, seven. And after release candidate one, it's new features, no, no new features, it's bug fixes and regressions only and new devices and quirks, and sometimes between RC1 and RC2, somebody slips some things in. But after RC2, definitely, regressions only. One every, one, every week, usually on a Sunday, uh, sometimes we're doing it on Saturday to catch people off guard. Um, a new release comes out, RC7, RC8, and then he does a new final one, pushes out, and we start the whole thing over again. That's how we do it. This is how we do development. Um, we were doing this, what, started 2003, um, we did this for a few years and realized that people wanted to use these kernels. So they didn't have a way to have bug fixes. The bug fixes that we were doing, and they wanted to get in their devices, they wanted to ship to their users. How do we collate these and collect them all in one spot? So we came up with the idea of stable kernels. So I maintained the stable kernel branch, one of them. Um, I forked from Linus and then they started doing 4.2.1, .2 .3, .4 .5. That's how that works. And then I do a release about once a week. I did a release earlier this morning, sitting in the back room. I've done releases from the stage here a number of times. Um, that's how we do kernels. So stable kernels come from there. Linus does a new one, and away we go. The rules for stable kernels. Um, they're all documented in the stable kernel, process, stable kernel rules file in the documentation. We can now link to it on kernel.org, thanks to John and other people's work. Um, rules are pretty simple. There they are. Um, the rules are there to say no to. <laughs> As came up last night while well, a number of us were talking and drinking. Um, if you want to get stuff, it's a very handy and convenient way to point people and say no, they don't fit those rules. If you have a justification for why your patch should go into stable and should get backported, um, talk to me. Email the list, we'll go from there. Um, that works out really well. But they're pretty easy. But the biggest and most important rule that we never try and break is it has to be in Linus's tree. And this lets you so you don't diverge. So we don't put a fix in a stable kernel, you update to a newer one of Linus's kernel, and it breaks because the fix wasn't there. The rule is it has to be in Linus's tree. About once every two months or so, I'll get a patch saying, oh, that was too big of a change in Linus's tree. Here's a smaller change just for stable kernels. I'll take, take that instead. And I've learned to reject it because 90% of those times that patch is broken. Seriously, I'll take a five patch, horrible long patch series of craziness that does work in Linus's tree just to stay compatible. In a way, I want to be bug compatible with Linus's tree. Sometimes we backport patches that turn out to be broken and I have to wait for them to get fixed in Linus's tree before I'll fix them in the stable tree. That happens at times, but we do work really fast for that but it has to be in Linus's tree because we never want to diverge. We never want you to be able to upgrade to a new kernel, be it Linus's new one, upgrade a new kernel in time, and have something break. That's really, really important. Um, a long time ago when I first started the stable kernels, uh, I worked at Novell on the kernel team there, and it made my life easier to start using stable kernels for make a long-term kernel. So I did 2.16. Oh, what was it? 16 or... I don't remember, 2.6.16 and then 32 and some other ones. And other companies started using those. So we came up with the idea of a long-term kernel. And these you'll see maintained on the kernel.org website. Um, and the rule is now we pick one a year and we maintain it for at least two years. So right now uh, I maintain the 4.4 and the 4.9 kernels trees. 
Uh, the 4.14, which will come out in a couple weeks, that we've declared as a long-term kernel. Turns out if we just pick the last one, the last release in the year, that seems to work out well for people's products. And then people build stuff on these. People build products on these, and then they're assured of getting patches backported to them in a consistent way. And that's really important. So if you're building a product, you're building a device, and you want to stay at a specific kernel version for whatever reason, and I'll get into that in a minute, pick a long-term kernel. This is a really, really good rule. So that's a good rule that Google now requires it for all Android devices. All new Android O devices have to be on a long-term kernel. This is a strict rule. Um, Android devices that are upgraded from an older version to newer ver to O has some different rules. But any new device coming out starting this year, or I know at least next year, has to be a long-term kernel. And that's really, really good. And because of that, we're talking about maintaining some of these for a little bit longer than four, two years, because by the time a product comes out, that time span that usually is about to be dropped on the floor. So we're talking about maintaining these a little bit longer. Ben is talking about maintaining some of these for maybe two or 10 to 20 years for some, some situations, and situations like um, traffic lights. Traffic lights now run Linux. You don't want to update those current, you don't want to update that hardware all the time. Sometimes you just pick a kernel Make sure stable, kernel, stable updates get to it and push them out. Much easier to test and maintain over time. And again, 20 years. Um, it's crazy, but it happens. So the rate of change in these kernels is kind of interesting. I looked at this. Um, the 4.4 kernel run about nine changes a day. They're getting backported there. 4.9, 13 changes a day. And 4.12, which I just obsoleted, it's, not, it's end of life, use 4.13 now. It averaged about 10 changes a day during its lifespan of a couple, week, a couple months. So 4.9 has been going for a year. So for a year, we've been backporting 13 changes a day. 4.49. Um, older kernels got less patches. And part of that is because people are caring more now. People are digging through the kernel trees. Um, Sasha and Julia are doing some great work digging through the kernel trees, training AI and machine learning on patches to see what we're missing and backporting them. It's a really, really good stuff because people rely on these kernels. Um, people also, maintainers, are now realizing that they need to be marking these patches. So they mark the patches for inclusion of the stable, they go there automatically and it works. People are building products on these and they rely on this, so they're going in there. It's really, really good. So um, 3.18 kernel was averaged about five a day. Uh, 3.16, Debian, only two patches a day. That was weird. Um, that's just Ben, I guess. <laughs> so, um, that, that was a little bit slower, but um, people do care about old Debian kernels. What's the new Debian release on? 4.9. Pardon me? 4.9. 4.9. Oh, good. Maybe that's why people are caring, right? Um, 3.2, I didn't look at what the rate of change was, but it's pretty low, thankfully. Um, so, yeah. So, that's our rate of change. So, these are bug fixes. They are quirks. They are reviewed by the maintainer of the subsystem, and they're blessed to go in. These are vetted patches that you should be taking. There's no reason you should be not taking these patches. So, if you're building a product, this is the rules. Um, every release is stable. Get that in through your head. We've been doing this for a decade. You can look at it, and you always have to upgrade your kernel. If you build a device with Linux, and you can't update your kernel, it's obsolete instantly. And it's obsolete instantly because the world changes, right? If the world, if you built a box and stuck in the corner and you had no input to it, great, that's fine. But the world changes, finds new exploits, finds new problems. We can't stop that. You have to update it. If your operating system does not change, it's obsolete and dead. It's that simple. So always, always, always update your kernel. So what about these? Um, yeah, this is on the record, too. <laughs> All right. In the speaker notes, I curse. So look at the speaker notes later. Um, blame your SOC provider. Um, I'll take an example. These are the last our Pixel phones, not the new ones that are coming out later, but the ones that came out, I guess, a year ago, the most popular ones. Um, this is the kernel tree. Um, if you can barely read that, um, they're adding... 2.8 million lines of code to the kernel. The kernel only runs 3.2 million lines of code. That is 88% of 
of the kernel code on here has never been reviewed by anybody. That's with any skill. <laughs> um, this is Linux-like. This is scary. This is really, really scary when you see that number. Um, this is what keeps devices stuck at old kernels. When you do crap like that, it's bad. Google realizes this. It's been pushing hard, and SOC manufacturers are changing. It's going to take time. I got agreement by the major, let's say the four major SOC managers out there in the world to change this, and it will happen. Some of their pipelines are really, really long a number of years. It will get better. I've been guaranteed and told that this will get better because this is unworkable. This is unmaintainable. This is not okay. So trying to update these kernels to the newest version from Linus is a lot of work when you got a forward port 2.8 million lines of code. If you just take the stable kernels, though, it's very easy. And that's what Google is requiring now. So they're requiring be on an LTS kernel, a long-term supported kernel, and take all the stable kernel updates. I'll show a demo of how they're not quite doing that yet. Um, but it's getting better. And the main reason why this is goes to the second point of my talk. So let's talk about kernel security. Kernel security, I mean, this happened on a public mailing list two days ago. Somebody's like, why can't the kernel guys just tell us what all the security bugs are? And we'll, we'll know to incorporate them, we'll take them. I've been at big manufacturers and say, They'll just t tell me what all the security bugs are and we'll fix those. And the problem is, everything can be a security issue in a way. And the problem is, most of those bugs that we fix are only determined to be security issues years later. There's an infamous TTY bug that I fixed in the TTY layer. Three years later, somebody realized how you could get root, and now all of a sudden, all rel boxes were vulnerable. Um, I didn't think it was a problem, because Red Hat only picks and chooses backporting patches, they missed it. If you had a stable kernel update, you would have got it. Um, there's an infamous phone, I don't remember who it was, or an SOC vendor that forked their kernel tree at two points in time, like a month apart. Went to two major manufacturers. A bug a year later came out that one that was a month older was completely vulnerable, the newer one was completely fixed. It wasn't vulnerable. That shows that if the other one had been updating its kernel, it would have been fixed. It would have been not. So the kernel security team's rule is all bugs can be a security issue, so just fix them. We fix them, push them out, and that's it. So if you notify the kernel security team of a bug, we give you one, we'll give you one week disclosure if we, if we can fix it that fast. Most of the time we can. We push it out publicly, and away we go. Um, other bugs, we just fix, push them out, and go. Get them in the stable trees. I do a release every week. Take them and go. That's our rule. This is why we do this. So for those people that, I say, that tell me, just tell me what the security bugs are, I'll take them, I do. I give you 11 patches a day. Take them. Some of these aren't always marked while they're stable or they're security issues, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but these are known bug fixes that you need to be taking. Take them all, don't cherry pick. Don't say this isn't good, this isn't bad. Look at them, take them all. There's no reason you shouldn't be taking them all. If you say, oh, I don't want to take them all because it doesn't, I don't build all those patches, or I don't build those drivers, then take them, it doesn't matter. It's just empty code in your tree. It makes your merge harder. Take them all, merge them in, and you know you're clean and you're good, and you can go. And Linus talked about this some. And here's where it gets to rant. 2008, um, PAX team was complaining that we don't notify all the security bugs. Lena says, um, oh, you guys can read. Can everybody read in the back? Um, they're just normal bugs. What did you have this? Security bugs should not be marked as such because bugs are bugs. And Lena says, um, no, in response to the commit should have to say it's a security issue. And here's why. And this is a big thing. So the big thing is if somehow if we mark patches as security, people start thinking that's the only bugs that are security related. And that's wrong because that means that they're thinking that the other types of bug fixes we do are less important. Again, that's wrong. If we have history to prove it on our side, bugs that we don't know that we fix today can be determined to be security related later. Again, bugs are bugs, fix them and move on. And people don't think it matters. And people are right, the marking is pointless. 
This is why we don't mark them. They're all fixes, just take them and move on. And finally, he finishes up, and again, he says it's pointless and wrong, what's unclear about this? It's an awesome email, it's an awesome thread. The links are there, they're in the slides, you can collect on them. It's a hundred email long thread. Um, I even yell at people. They got that much fun. Um, it was good. So this is why we do what we do, because bugs are bugs, fix them and move on. And again, PAX team was like, well, what about this? Security bugs that you know about, because we know some bugs are security issues. And Leah says, it is not helpful to point this out, because number one, if I point this out to the world, and all of a sudden the whole world is vulnerable. Number one, give people a chance to update, or, and it's just, if we have reproducers, Great, we'll reproduce it to make sure we fix the bug, they're curated, they're in our tree that we know works together, we say this is fixed this way, our reproducer works, we keep it private, you move on. You can announce it later with your reproducers later if you want to, and a lot of people do that. They send us in the security team, they send us, here's a bug, here's a reproducer, fix it, we fix it, we push it out, a couple weeks later or a month later, they get the public credit for it and they push out the reproducer, everybody's happy, um, that's great. Do that, move on if you want to do that. You want the fame, we don't care from the security team. Security team also does not ask for CVEs. A lot of people can mess with that. There's a whole issue whether CVEs matter or not. I'm not gonna get into that. There's a really good talk at Black Hat a number of years ago about why CVEs don't matter, or you can't really trust anything by looking at the number of CVEs. That's another topic. So again, push it and move on. And then Linus keeps on going. You no, know, we should not document the exploit in the commit message. Um, because that's bad. I have a bug here that actually somebody did document in the commit message and it never got picked up by devices. <laughs> so even if you do document it in the commit message, people miss that, which is like nobody's looking at this crap. Take all the stable patches, just move on. So really good emails, uh, how to report a security bug, there's documentation on how to do that. Um, this is why we do what we do. This is why the kernel security team works this way. Um, that's it. Questions? Yes. This, is, this seems to run a bit contrary to what Thomas uh, said a bit earlier where he said, I want a commit message to explain why it's doing something, not what it's doing. Yes, it is a little bit contrary. And we do say, we bury things. We will purposefully bury things saying, this fixes a problem in the VFS layer when this and this and this could happen. And if you know what you're talking about. It's not contrary, well, okay, James. It's not contrary. The point he was making is you don't have a commit message that says what the code is doing because you can read the code. You have a commit message that explains why what is being done is being done. Potentially a security issue could be an explanation of why, but usually the why of a bug is uh, much more technically detailed than a security exploit actually would tell you, right? So you can still have a good commit message for a security bug that doesn't actually list the exploit. Yeah. And a quite helpful right there. About what you said um, just a little bit earlier about uh, what the SOC vendors are doing with the kernel. Yesterday at Embedded Recipes, we had uh, uh, one of the speaker showing that a uh, SOC vendor have been putting into a Wi-Fi driver a way to get root on the device. <laughs> just by sending an order using the Wi-Fi device. Yes. Which is just scary, and it's under production. So we cannot trust them at all. No, so I have, so I think um, Google publicly posted these numbers um, for kernel bugs and kernel crashes in devices that are in the field. It was 80%, was it 80% or bigger? Of all bugs that were found, 80, it were in non, upstream code was in these drivers, in the stuff that the SOCs add. It's that bad. Um, I have run Coverity checkers on another major SOC vendors, not the one I was showing you, a different ones, and it's just horrible. It's like obvious problems are there. Um, it's bad, it's really bad, and they, but they know it. Now they know it, they did that for various reasons, they realize they cannot keep doing this because we rely too much on their, these devices and they're changing. So, interesting uh, that you mentioned that because 
uh, I was discussing with uh, somebody at Google, actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And they have a team over there who is developing a new non-Linux uh, operating system with a stable driver ABI in order to support, to do exactly the wrong thing, which is to support basically Windows-style binary drivers that they never have to update forever while still updating their kernel. Now, my gut feeling is that's just going to end up in a wall and they're never going to manage to, to, to finish that, that project. But... Uh, and, and you, in, it's always the same SOC manufacturer that come on top. It is. Start with a Q, finish with an M, yeah. we all know who it is. <laughs> um, do you believe there is progress with that specific company? Yes. Okay. I have been in the room where executives have said we are going to fix it, and they have overridden the objectors in that company. So they know that this needs to be fixed. Okay. Uh, the problem with these SOCs, the big problem is these... Um, these devices, what's in these devices today, will be in the IoT devices in five years, because stuff trickles down. And when you're getting a kernel for a brand new device in six or seven years, that's based on a three-year-old kernel that's eight years old to start with, and is never getting updates. My Nexus 5X is a 3.10. Yes. Three ten. Oh, that's actually good. I have a 3.4, actually. <laughs> um, yes, okay. Um, the, the number was split up between the, the Android kernel bugs, where they came from, uh -huh. was between uh, vendor drivers, which are both in upstream and out of tree, so that was mixed together, and core kernel, and vendor driver bugs was 85%. Okay. <laughs> uh, one question regarding the process of stable kernels. Um, I'm always kind of annoyed when pulling or when fetching from your repository or any stable kernel repository because uh, you cherry pick the commits. So when I fetch from your repository, uh, I upload my own repository and the download is very large if I'm on a slow internet connection. Uh, I, I have most of these commits that you have cherry picked already in my repository but because they have a different uh, hash ID, uh, they are all downloaded once again and they get, they add additional objects to my Git repository. Is there anything that could be changed about the process uh, to make it easier to fetch from stable uh, repositories? For example, uh, I assume that the majority of patches um, lands in spec port to more than one uh, older kernel. So, if, for example, it, it, I, it, would, I, it, would, it would seem possible to me that, uh, for instance, uh, patches are applied to 4.4 and then merged to 4.9, and that way there would be fewer commits that I would, would have to pull. Um, actually, you'd get more. You'd get more there. Um, the cherry pick, the way Git works, cherry pick also creates a new, a new blob. So you'd have to do it. Mer you don't want to merge a major tree with a major tree. It just would be hell from a Git point of view. Um, just, there's also, I keep all the patches separately as a stable queue. If you just want the patches, you can just pull from that. There's a stable queue repo. It's a series of quilt trees. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you're going to have to pull some patches. But we're talking uh, 100 patches, say 100 patches a week. I mean, overall Git is, I don't know what kind of line you're on, but pulling a Linus's tree would be, what, it's 10 times, it's worse than that, because I'm only doing 10, I'm only doing 10 changes a day, He's, we're doing 10 changes an hour in history. Um, that's an issue with Git. Yeah. Uh, just to related remarks to what you said that are improving their process. What I found to be quite beneficial is the, the automotive industry, where the life cycles are much longer. At least most people don't throw away their car in two years. Um, An internet of things where you end up with lots of much smaller vendors. So they can't support. The, for a smartphone, there are only a few big vendors. So an SOC vendor can support them. Yeah, and that's can't what's... support uh, 10,000 different little vendors that all right. make internet of things didn't. I mean, I won't claim that it's just us saying this. Is to, over the years, it finally sunk through. It's the market forces that's finally caught up with them because they know they have to support these devices for long periods of time, and the only way they can viably do that is if their code is upstream. So now it's turned into, it is a business decision for them. It will save them time and money, which we told them all along, but they had to come about it themselves, which is fine. That's the way everybody is. Um, so Google is requiring um, LTS releases for uh, Android vendors to... Uh... For Android O. Yeah. Um, 
So are they also inquiring, um, you're to, inquiring vendors to follow your LTS tree? Like if you um, match it on top of they it? St I don't know about requiring, they strongly encourage it. It's in the public documentation for Android L right now that they strongly mm -hmm. encourage it. Um, I'll show a demo where they're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, so, it, and why they should be there. They know the reasons why. Um, again, it's a whole ecosystem that they have to push through. They have to get through their security team. They have to get through the, uh, the carriers in the U.S. are very strict about what they allow for updates and how things go for there. It's, a, it's an incremental process over years. It's getting better. Um, I would love for them to be able to test as part of their testing process that they are taking all the updates and people said they want to. I don't know if that's going to happen. There are automated tests today for Android O that you have to run in order to get Play Store approval that checks for the kernel versions. And it runs uh, regression tests on the kernel now. So it's really good. So part of the Android testing infrastructure is actually regression tests that the stable kernels aren't breaking things, which is awesome. So they're testing the kernel now. Uh, I wanted to say that I strongly disagree with the person who talked before Hans. I don't know who it was. Ah, okay. Uh, regarding uh, an alternative process uh, where uh, we would uh, merge the fixes first in the oldest, oldest kernels and later in the more uh, recent kernels for multiple reasons. Uh, the first one is that you never know how far back, how far you, you need to go back. Uh, for some time, I maintained the 2.4 kernel that nobody cared about. Uh, so uh, you end up with a split process where you have to backport to a certain point, uh, to, to fix at a certain point, and backport for certain kernels and port for other ones. Uh, another issue is the delay to get the fixes in mainline and in uh, the most used kernels, which is not acceptable at all. Another issue is that uh, sometimes we have to heavily modify the patches to make them fit in older kernels, and from time to time we get them wrong. Uh, maybe less in the most recent kernels, but I think that uh, Ben and myself uh, can have a few examples of this probably. And if you get a patch uh, work correctly in an old kernel and the person facing the bug upgrades two years later to a more recent kernel and faces the same bug again, it's very hard to, uh, to work on it again. Uh, conversely, if you fix it in mainline, the person using the most recent kernel will confirm whether it's fixed or not. And if we fail the, fix, the, the backport, uh, someone facing the, the issue will report it and we will fix it again. But at least we will not uh, damage, uh, cause damage to a kernel that people will face again two years later. So that's very important. Yeah. Another thing about older kernels, and um, I've had companies say, well, I'll just put a junior developer on maintaining this old kernel for longer periods of time. The older the kernel is, the harder the work is. So you need a, your most advanced person working on the oldest kernel, and if that seems like a waste of their resources, maybe you should reconsider why you're doing this. Um, it's hard, and Ben is the expert, and Willie, uh, the expert at doing this stuff. The older the kernel, it's... No, I am, I'm not an expert at all on this. But no, I mean, the work you guys have to do to backboard this up, I, uh, with two years and less, is usually very easy. Um, with our churn of API, it doesn't work. So, yep. So, I have a question uh, relating to what Thomas said earlier in his talk. Uh, how... Um, how do you trust uh, companies that when they say they're going to fix, fix things? How do I trust how companies you, when they're going to fix things? How do you trust corporates? Uh, trust but verify, right? So Google is mandating this. So now they're, tr now they're verifying what kernel versions are in devices. And that's, that's, that's the best thing to do, right? And whether they verify that they're going to take all the LTS patches or not, that, that might be something great to do from there. Um, so it's trust but verify, right? You got to verify. And they ha it's what, carrot and stick, right? You gotta give them a reason to why to do this, and they have to make it a business decision why to do this, so they are doing that. So hopefully, it'll trickle down. Uh, just a, a small question on um, the long-term stable releases, uh, where you could just suggest people to just update the kernel with the latest stable uh, version and not cherry-pick specific security fixes. Mm -hmm. but 
isn't this uh, what a vendor like Red Hat, for example, is doing exactly on, for example, the latest release where you have a 3.10 Linux kernel with some cherry-picked uh, important security fixes? Yeah, so yes, it is true. Um, if you trust a vendor to do this for you and you pay them, great. I won't say that. Red Hat and SUSE do do this. But like Willie just said, they miss things. The RHEL TTY bug is a perfect example. There's been another one really recently that was just published publicly on a mailing list last night. They missed another one. Um, that was actually marked and they missed it. So people miss things, right? That just happens. But if they had sucked them all in, they would have got them all. Um, I would argue that they need to change their stuff. Susan and Red Hat have different issues, but they're getting there. If you trust those guys, I would say they're doing a great job. So they're doing a good job. Um, but look at what Debian, actually Debian does a better job than they do. I'd argue that. <laughs> um, Debian was just um, announced that the number one cloud, Linux running in the cloud, runs on Debian, actually. So the world is kind of backing that up. Uh, this is a debate I had with uh, Willy a long time ago, and we did not agree on that. I would love to get your opinion on it. Uh, one of the rules that applies to the Sable kernel is never had a new feature. But I had a driver, a network driver, that was broken into the uh, Sable series. There is a fix which induces a new feature. And so I was, st uh, I was um, locked in that. Because if I want my network driver to work, I have to backport the, the driver, but Stable refused it because it had a new feature. And so I just have to maintain myself the cherry picking of the proper commits to make it work. And I cannot give this back to the Stable users because I'm not allowed to have these new features that just make it working. So the Stable uh, semantic, in my case, the driver was not Stable functionally speaking, and so I was not able to share this work with the other uh, users. Right. So there's two parts to this. Number one, the driver author should have split their patches up so that the fixes went in first and then the new features went in later. And we've gotten better at that. We've started to enforce that. So they should have fixed the problem and then added new features. By mushing it all together, sometimes by accident, um, I've started to take the whole series now, especially if it's self-contained for a driver. If the maintainer agrees and the developer involved agrees and a user said, yes, this fixes my problem, I'm much more willing to do that. If you look at... Um, the releases I just did today for one of the SCSI drivers for IBM, I think it's for one of IBM's things, they backported a whole bunch of patches. And you could argue that some of them weren't only bug fixes, but the end result made for a much more stable working device for older users, so I took them all. And actually for 3.18, I only took half of them, and the developers were like, wait, 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 you didn't get them all. So um, I need to fix that up and take the rest of them. So over time, we've done that. Um, talked about that. We've also talked about adding the K self test um, tests that are in the kernel for testing things to older stable kernels. Um, we talked about that in the plumbers conference. Maybe we'll do that, maybe we won't, because people are grabbing the latest K self tests and running against older kernels, which is a perfectly valid thing to do. Um, but it make it easier, maybe we should just dump them all in the older kernels. Too. I don't know. Um, So it depends. So talk to us about it. What circumstances do you consider a lack of a feature as a bug? I mean, is that, is yeah. a typical example, I added VLAN support to network driver and we thought VLANs working properly, that was unusable on a class of devices and that's typically the kind of stuff that's probably a good candidate for backport. Talk to me. <laughs> In this specific example, it didn't matter, but okay. generally but yes. speaking. We're, we're, we're flexible. We're, we're, we want to try and work with it because we know people are, some people are stuck with older kernels because of this problem. And we want to we want to solve. We want them to be able to not. We want them to be able to have be able to use their kernels, right? And not do something like that. and not have to maintain out of fork tree out of tree forks. Um, that being said, some people want oh just take this new feature X Y Z because I really really rely on it. It'll make the kernel better or whatnot. If you're adding 2.8 million lines of code to your kernel, just add the five other patches <laughs> and for the new feature and go on. That's easier too. So. All right, I got to go on. I'm right, running out of time. I want to show a demo, maybe. Um, again, take everything, don't pick and choose. Um, you don't know what does and doesn't fix things. Um, if testing shows when they're all together, we will fix them. If, you're testing, if you guys are testing and cherry picking crap, we don't have any idea what you're doing, we will not support you. The community will not support you. 
Um, and again, changes that happen to other parts of the kernel, um, just take them because you never know if you are using them or not. I love it when I, you show that people are using things they didn't realize it. Uh, I filed a bug on one of the old Nexus phones. There's a whole weird security driver out there with ports open to the world that they didn't even realize were enabled because it just happened to come part of this default configuration. If they had ever enabled it, they didn't realize it was even on there. So people don't even know what's on their devices sometimes. Take them off. And then enable hardening features. Case is gonna talk about this tomorrow. Enable hardening features for when there are bugs, because it's defense in depth. There will be bugs. Let's try and fix these. So I have a demo. I have um, two Pixel phones. They're the same version. Um, one has the latest version as updated by Google, and one has a developer. I actually have root on this one um, with an updated kernel that I did. Um, it took me a while, well, I say a day, um, to go through some old bugs and try and crack this thing. Um, it took me five different tries because Android's defense in depth stopped me. The patches were, there were bugs in the kernel and I couldn't exploit them. Some of them were permissions that an untrusted user just couldn't get access to. Some of them were the stack smashing, I'm guessing. It just would not work. Um, others were, this is Willie's infamous bug about pipes, that you could suck up resources in the system by allocating tons and tons of pipe memory. Um, all these crashed my desktop easily. Um, but I could not get a denial of service of resources on an Android phone, which is really, really good. The defense in depth works. Just run Chrome. Run Chrome. <laughs> um, no, so defense in depth works. It's proven to work. So five known exploits did not work. On, no, four. A fifth one I did get to work. So you can quote me. And let's see if I can do this stuff. So, the video for Linux guys are going to laugh that I'm using cheese to show a video camera. <laughs> okay, so I'm running Termex on a phone, uh, untrusted user, um, no root permissions, you name. I'm running, what does it say? 3.18.52. This is the latest security update from Google. And I have a program on here, intuitively named Crash. <laughs> um, 3.18.72 I just did today. Um, yeah, so 3.18.52 uh, was in May. It was the kernel that they picked for this. So the latest kernel update came from May. Um, a person in this room is bug fix I'm exploiting. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to say what it is because that's kind of rude. But I hit enter and my phone is locked up. Will it reboot? It's hosed. The watchdog should kick in. Come on. There it goes. <laughs> so it's dead. And it'll come back. I mean, that's the nice thing about Android. Um, they don't classify a number of these bugs uh, of a local denial of service. If you just can reboot your phone, everything just comes back just fine. Um, I talked to some people. I need to maybe weaponize these a little bit better. I'm not good at weaponizing things. I'm good at fixing bugs. Um, so that's it. So today's latest Google phone. I'm not picking on Google. They're doing good things, but they aren't updating their kernels good enough. Um, again. No, I'm not going to get a bounty for this. <laughs> it's a bug. It's already been fixed. Yeah, some people yeah, that's fine. OK, so updated phone is running 3.18.60. Oh, wow. So it's fixed between them. 60 came out in June. <laughs> um, and this is fixed accidentally just by the fact that they didn't um, take the, if they took the update, do that, run crash, and it just exits. Yep, still running. Um, so everybody, they still need more work. Um, my one touch that I use, I use as my main phone is running 318, what, 30 something? It's bad. 
Um, I'm not gonna even try and crash that. Actually, I did. I tried exploits and I messed up my file system. Um, <laughs> On their phone, oh, I don't think we want to do that. That's just going to make us sad. Of who is the oldest kernel version on their phone? Um, I mean, this is true. If you're not, these devices are not running the latest one. It is unsecure. Um, I can weaponize this if people want to make it real. Um, I'm just going to push through Google security and get them to update it. Um, those guys are totally overworked. I understand why they're doing it. But if they took the latest stable update, it would be fixed. And again, this is why. Um, 19, uh, 1911, over a century ago, the astronomer said this, um, people somehow think computers are isolated in a box and nothing changes. They can just put out a phone in the world and nothing's going to change because it passed their testing. The world changes. If it didn't change, it would die. So those phones are dead. Change. And that's it. My time's up. Thank you very much.